committed to disruptive growth ideas. Uh, we know that when companies implement these ideas, they typically produce very phenom phenomenal results. They are, on average, companies grow 120% faster. And we have some great stories that we're proud of that we have played at least a little part in um, the development of uh, ideas that have led to new revenue and profit. However, we have never, until now, really taken seriously the next level of challenge. So I, th I think of it as we have our in you have the individual, you have the team, and then you have the organizational structure around the team. And that organizational structure prevents, often, ideas from propagating, people from acting innovatively. So um, I've spent the last three years beginning to research this, process, the, the, this, this topic of entrepreneurship. I've interviewed about 120 internal entrepreneurs. This will be the topic of my next book. And we're already starting to do some of this work with clients. And so what we're going to do here is share with you uh, the framework that is emerging out of this work. So um, my father is from Germany. And after World War II, um, he uh, started, you know, moving up in his education and his, the system, the educational system slated him to be a machine mechanic. That was what it was determined was the right career path for him. Uh, my mother is from Bangladesh and she, uh, although she was top of her class in terms of grade, uh, grades um, and, you know, extremely brilliant, um, the social system, the the society was going to slate her to be married. So they had identified um, the person that she was going to marry. And I'm going to argue that the world is a better place because my mother and father did not follow the track that the system laid out for them. And that there are hundreds of millions of people who similarly can benefit the world if we can create systems that allow them not to follow the track but to really find their opportunity to contribute. We were working with a logistics company and we, had, we were working with the team to come up with an idea and they developed this idea that they could operate seaports because they had all the assets that you would need or many of the assets you need to compete there. But at the end of it, the organization demoted the idea, got rid of the idea, and what we found was that just a few years later, the port that they wanted to outsource, uh, take the, you know, do the outsourcing from, um, they had outsourced the, uh, the, 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 um, um, the operation of the ship to this uh, Dubai-based company. And this represented for us this, uh, this, this problem that the organiza organizational structures often kill off ideas that could be of significant benefit to the company. This could have opened up an entirely new revenue source. And this happens too often. And there is a particular culprit, I think, and Al Thinker thinks, that causes this to happen. And, and this is the culprit. The entrepreneur, and I, I, you know, I have to say, I'm an entrepreneur. We do a lot of work with entrepreneurs. We love entrepreneurialism. But there is this idea of who the entrepreneur is. The entrepreneur is the guy that quit Harvard, put on a hoodie, moved to the West Coast, started a billion-dollar company, and then scaled that company. And so we looked to test out this narrative. You know this narrative, right? The, the individual comes up with this idea. They go into a garage with a small team. You have the hacker, the hustler, the hipster, and they design this thing. And then they launch the big company that takes down the incumbents. And so we wanted to test how true is this story and what's the truth. Uh, we took the 30 most transformative innovations over the last 30 years as judged by a panel of um, uh, professors from Wharton based off 2,000 submissions. These are things like MRIs, DNA sequencing, the internet, email, these innovations that have really changed the world for many of us. And we asked, is it the entrepreneur that led those innovations? What we found is that 22 out of 30 of those innovations were introduced by employees and only eight of them by entrepreneurs. Who develops it? Is it the small team in the garage? Well, actually, 15 out of 30 are developed by communities and large formal teams. Entrepreneurs only developed four of them. 
And who scales the idea and turns it into a, a, a large business? This is kind of where the bad news is, even for large companies. 16 out of 30 are scaled by the competition. Entrepreneurs scale two of them. So if we really want to understand the source of innovations that are most meaningful to humankind, what we need to do is not only look at the entrepreneur, but we need to look at the intrapreneur. It is the intrapreneur that will invent the innovations that will change the future. They are people like these unsung heroes, like the guy that was working at IKEA. And this is 10 years after IKEA had a launched. And he was helping a customer get a table into the back of the car. The table didn't fit, so he removed the legs and he folded them and slid it in. And that gave IKEA the idea that they should sell all of their furniture that way. The flat pack box that is the, at the heart of IKEA's strategy is born. This idea was introduced not upon the founding of IKEA. This idea was introduced 10 years after its founding, and it was introduced by employee, not by the CEO, not by the entrepreneur. Or Heather Davis, one of our clients at TIAA-CREF, um, now called TIAA, and she had this idea. They own about $25 billion in agricultural real estate, and she thought if we could find a way to turn agricultural real estate, which primarily now you can only own and transact in private transactions, like through private equity, if that could be as liquid and tradable as commercial real estate, then we could build an asset management business around those assets. And she pushed for this internally and convinced TIA, Kreft, to, TIA to put in place the changes that were needed in order to enter the asset management business. They did that three years ago, and now it is the they they have the tenth largest asset management company in the world. It's right up there with KKR. These are the entrepreneurs that we are interested in. Now, when we share this, often people say, "Well, wasn't that the past? I mean, we've gone from the era of the large company to the area of the era of the entrepreneur, right?" I mean, there's some data to support that. It's harder and harder for large companies to stay large when large companies made it onto the S and P um, 500 list and the 1960s, they could expect to be on that list for 60 years. Today, they can only expect to stay on that list for about 15 years. Public companies are delisting earlier at a younger age, more frequently. But it is not a story of the big losing out and the small growing. Actually, entrepreneurial rates are declining. In the United States, if we look at startups per 100,000 people, we used to have 250. Now we have less than 150. If we look at the number of people who are employed by large companies versus small companies, the red line represents the percentage of U.S. employees that are um, uh, employed by companies of 250 or more people, large companies. We can see their share of employees is growing. The share of small employees is declining. So it's not a question of big versus small. There's something else going on. And what we believe is going on is acceleration. Tesla Motors recently had to issue a recall. What they would normally have done or what a normal company would have done is send out a bunch of letters to car owners, have those car owners bring them to dealerships, have people at the dealerships change the mechanics of the car, and then give them back to the owners. This would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars. This would have taken a year. Instead, what did Tesla do? It beamed down new software that adjusted the car's programming so that it was elevated six, I mean, um, half an inch higher above the ground when it was on the highway, and that solved the problem. What should have cost $100 million probably could only cost a few thousand dollars. What should have taken a year took 30 seconds. What we see is acceleration. As companies and, or, and, and products move from physical to digital, McKinsey calls these asset light businesses. What we see is that they start evolving more quickly. They improve performance and reduce costs exponentially. It used to cost $75 to produce a kilowatt of solar energy or le electricity from solar power in 1975. Today, it costs less than 75 cents. 
DNA sequencing. It used to cost you $2 million to sequence a human DNA. Today, that takes that costs only $2,000. Drones you can buy for $20 or $30 that only five years ago would have cost you $700. And we have technologies like 3D printing, which are further uh, driving down costs and improving performance. And the issue is, as we move into this more uh, faster-paced exponential improvement, companies are still operating in an outdated model. Companies are still operated as centrally planned economies. And we've given up central planning with uh, economies, but not with businesses, as a result of which the hierarchy cannot keep up with the pace of change. It takes too long for ideas to come up to the top, for the decision maker to make a decision and for them to go back down. By the time that happens, the market has moved on. Some companies are on top of this. Some companies are realizing they need to restructure in the, in the, in, in the U.S. Army. We see a movement from a strict hierarchy towards a team of teams approach. We have companies like Zappos adopting uh, um, uh, models like Holacracy, where no one has a job description and they just uh, every week pick a new job and you might have 20 different roles and those roles continually change. You have companies like Red Hat, which is the leader in open source software, and they take their principles for organizing communities of developers to how they organize their businesses, their business, and many other businesses are starting to adopt this approach. What we see is a new organizational model emerging, which is allowing innovation to come from entrepreneurship. Another way to say this is we're seeing entrepreneurial intensity becoming increasingly important. Academics define entrepreneurial intensity or the level of entrepreneurial intensity by the frequency by which your company produces innovative ideas and the degree to which those ideas are innovative, risk-taking, proactive. And if we, do, if we look at this, there are five different types of companies. There are many companies that infrequently produce ideas that are of a low degree of innovativeness. These are periodic incremental um, businesses. We see some that frequently come up with incremental ideas. Think of them as maybe BMW, which continually innovates by putting new um, uh, product features into its cars, um, but is not expanding into new business models. We have periodic discontinuous businesses. This is a company, if your company it executes one strategy for five or 10 years and then has to reinvent itself periodically, then you would fit here. Academics have a, a, a term dynamic, which is, I think, kind of a catch-all for all these uh, dimensions. And there are some companies like Amazon.com, let's say, or Google, which are truly revolutionary. It doesn't mean that all companies need to be revolutionary, but it does mean if you can move towards the top right of this, you will benefit with faster revenue growth. This is shown to correlate with increased total return to shareholder, increased economic value added, and increased employee engagement. So it is valuable and it is necessary for us all to start increasing the entrepreneurial intensity of our organizations. Now, we don't know if we have the absolute solution. There is actually quite a bit of research that has gone into already how to increase entrepreneurial intensity. Uh, and what we've done is we've collected that research. We've interviewed about 120 entrepreneurs, and we are putting together a framework that can help us increase uh, entrepreneurial intensity. Um, so I'm going to go through these five. Um, the first step is abandoning the myth. The second is people the third is structure, the fourth is culture, the fifth is ideas. And the idea is that you need to have a system in which there's congruence. You have to have the right people, put them under the right structure, arm them with the right culture, and enable to produce the ideas in the right way in order to drive greater uh, entrepreneurial intensity. Um, so let's talk about the first one, this, um, uh, the myth. Uh, and the myth that I'm talking about is this idea of um, innovation antibodies, right? It's maybe every month I'm attending some conference where somebody uses the word innovation antibodies. The idea is that large organizations, when they 
when someone introduces an innovative idea into a large organization, these innovation antibodies emerge to kill the idea. And usually you get these knowing grins and nods. Um, but I believe that this entrepreneurial, the, 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 this idea is actually false. And research does support that. Research shows that as companies scale, the level of entrepreneurship does decline. Because as companies scale, they need to systematize and put in processes and procedures. However, if you look beyond the initial scaling, what you see is actually entrepreneurship can start increasing. First, risk-taking uh, uh, um, Risk taking allows entrepreneurship allows for risk taking, and then we have bureaucratization, narrowing of tasks, tight monitoring of of roles. Risk aversion comes in to decrease entrepreneurship, but then we have these other factors: excess capacities, excess resources, the ability to absorb and diversify risk that actually increases entrepreneurship. So it's not a question of entrepreneurship declining; it's a question of getting through this chasm in between being an entrepreneurial organization and being an intrapreneurial organization. So that's the first thing I invite you to do is abandon the myth that large companies cannot innovate. Second, we'll go to people. There is this idea of what the right kind of person is that will drive entrepreneurship. And we think often that the person that drives entrepreneurship is the entrepreneur. And in some ways, entrepreneurs behave very much like entrepreneurs. Sean Neff is an entrepreneur. He was trying to build a business selling t-shirts. And he was, an act, he was an active snowboarder. So he was trying to get his friends who are professional snowboarders to wear his t-shirts. They couldn't because they were all under contracts with major brands and they weren't allowed to put someone else's shirt on. So he asked them for their contracts. He read through their contracts and what he found was their contracts didn't uh, prevent them from wearing headgear. So he completely changed his business model. He went to a dollar store because there was a, a big um, snowboarding competition coming up in a couple days. He didn't have time to produce new products. So he went to a dollar store. He bought some hats some um, beanie, beanies, and with a marker, he wrote his name, Neff, on the hat. A and then he gave it to his friends. They wore it. At the end of that competition, three out of the four medalists were wearing Neff hats. And that was the beginning of the Neff brand, which today is one of the leading um, lifestyle brands for um, um, skateboarders and snowboarders. So one thing that entrepreneurs do is they recognize an opportunity. Opportunity doesn't knock. They recognize the opportunity. But the way that entrepreneur, entrepreneurs recognize and pursue the opportunity is different. Andy Jassy, for example, he is an executive at Amazon. And when a retailer asked Amazon if they could manage the servers and technology for that retailer's um, online business, Andy Jassy saw an opportunity. He didn't view Amazon as an e-tailer. He saw Amazon as a technology firm that is good at managing servers, tracking payments, tracking um, managing content. And he recognized that if this retailer wanted their services, other retailers might want their services. And he pushed Amazon to test out and launch Amazon Web Services. This happened seven years ago. After seven years, Amazon Web Services is a $10 billion business. It con contributes more than 100% of Amazon's profit, meaning Amazon's core business doesn't make money and Amazon Web Services does. This is how entrepreneur entrepreneurs act. They recognize the opportunity, not just as a market opportunity, but they also understand the assets and capabilities of their employer that they can leverage to create an advantage in the space. And the way they go about it is also different. It is much more a political challenge than it is a market challenge. Jean um, Fuel, for example, she is an editor at Macmillan, and she recognized an opportunity. There were increasingly self-published authors who were declined for a book deal, would self-publish, were successful, 
and then would uh, would, um, would would be approached by Macmillan with a proposal for a book deal, to which the author would say, "Well, I don't need you anymore. Uh, I've got a million Facebook fans. I can print this on. I can cr- put a PDF on Amazon.com, and I can keep all the money of myself." This was happening with increasingly frequency, and Gene recognized that, that this could become a disruptive threat to Macmillan's business model. So she started circulating an idea that eventually became Swoon Reads. The way she did it actually was interesting is she held a pizza party. She said, we should have a platform that allows self-published authors, would-be self-published authors, to publish on our platform, get feedback from the community, and then we can pick off the manuscripts that have the greatest potential. We will be the channel by which self-published authors publish. And she held a pizza party. She sent out an email to all of the employees at Macmillan and said, if you love romance and you're interested in doing something new, we're going to have a pizza party and I want to talk to you about an idea. She was hoping maybe five or 10 people showed up, 30 people showed up. And not just people that were from the business side, but salespeople, operations people, marketing people, people that all just loved romance. And she got this team together. She informally started running experiments. She got a little bit of money from her boss to do a trial and then uh, built momentum. People were working nights and weekends. Her boss told me that you know he was very excited about the engagement he was seeing. They were doing it on nights and weekends. They weren't taking um, time or resources away from their core business. And they were so passionate about it, he couldn't tell them no. It became Swoon Reads. Um, The way Swoon Reads works is if you are an author, you can submit a manuscript. The community starts interacting with you and giving you feedback on the manuscript. And then they rate you according to heat, tears, laughs, and thrills. And it becomes a Dancing with the Stars competition. That was the idea that they had, was calling it kind of a Dancing with the Stars for uh, romance authors. And the top 10 become the top five, become the top three. Macmillan picks the winner. And the winner, of course, gets a publishing contract. So now what Jean did, because she saw an opportunity, she recognized that it leveraged the assets of the company. She rallied the team and resources around the opportunity. She built it up, and then she handed it off to someone else. And this is one interesting aspect of entrepreneurs is they don't usually get to own the idea. They don't get to get rich off the idea. So they're a different character of person, not an entrepreneur. She scales it, puts it into the business, and now they have turned what could have been a fatal threat into a competitive advantage. So this this person is not an entrepreneur. This person is not a manager. This person is an entrepreneur. And what the research shows is that there are certain attributes that correlate with successful entrepreneurial behavior. Three of them are similar to that of entrepreneurs. They're innovative thinkers. They act with autonomy. They have market or competitive awareness. They're the kind of people that read industry reports, that track what the competition does. But beyond that, there are three attributes that are different. They don't like taking risks. They like taking calculated risks. They're not betting their money. They're betting someone else's money. They have an intrinsic motivation to motivate because they know they're not going to get rich from their inventions. They have and get instead get intrinsic value from having introduced something. That's a big difference between entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. And the last one is that they have political acumen and they enjoy the politics. There's been research recently that shows the key distinguisher between successful internal innovators and the frustrated ones is that the successful innovators view the political challenge as part of the problem solving process. So you want to identify entrepreneurs that have these attributes, that they're innovative, autonomous, they have market competitive awareness, they like taking calculated risks, they, have intrins- they get intrinsic value from innovating, and they have political acumen. So that's step two, identify your entrepreneurs. Next, we're going to go to step three, which is addressing the structural barriers to innovation. And I'm going to show you later that there are um, a few key structural barriers that the research calls out. Um, I do want to say that this is what is often cited as a reason that large companies can't innovate. You know, we know the idea of the disruptive innovation. 
which uh, essentially says that large companies have systems and priorities that have them kill off innovative ideas that could potentially disrupt or damage their core business. We found that this is an important dynamic, but we don't see it nearly as prevalent as people believe it to be inside large companies. The thing is that we need to recognize that to innovate in a large company, you have to work with the structures rather than against them. Another way of putting it is that you need to find a way to disrupt the market without disrupting your business. Think of it this way. An idea can be either disruptive to the market or not. It can be disruptive to your business or not. There are two independent variables here. Often we collapse these and we think that if it is disruptive to the market, it must be disruptive to the business. Or if it is not disruptive to the business, it can't be disruptive to the market. A better way to look at it is, you know, you have business as usual. You have uh, doing copycat work, which is kind of what we think that large, one thinks that large companies are, um, uh, are, are relegated to. There is radical innovation, which is both disruptive to your business and disruptive to your market, which is what which is where the, um, the uh, innovator's dilemma and disruptive innovation comes in. But there is this sweet spot in the top left, this winning moves, ideas that with business models that are disruptive to the market, but not disruptive to your business. It takes a little extra work to get you there, but that is the way that large companies innovate. Xbox, for example, was an idea developed by a guy that was uh, an Xbox um, was a, was a Microsoft employee. He was flying a plane, and he was reading an article that was talking about PlayStation Two. And PlayStation Two was going to be a radical innovation that was going to transform gaming, and it was going to eat up all of the opportunities for PC developers. Think about game developers as following in, in, in two categories. There are those who develop games for platforms, like the PlayStation, like Nintendo. There are those who develop games for PCs. With PCs, you can develop games at a lower cost. It's much more community-oriented. Um, Minecraft, for example, was developed as a PC game. And he said there is a large population, a community of developers that want to keep developing for PCs. And if PlayStation really is as successful as people think it's going to be, they're no longer going to have an opportunity. We need to find a solution for them. So he created Xbox as a... Um, as, a, 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 as a console game, but it is designed with its tools and the way that you program for it to appeal to and be used by PC game developers. It was that insight that moved the idea away from being disruptive towards being supportive. It leveraged the strengths that Microsoft had, the credibility it had with PC gamers, and gave them a console on which to develop. And Xbox is you know, one of the most successful innovations for the company and one of the best examples of large company um, uh, innovation. So what you want to do is you want to move from the bottom right to the top left. Don't don't copycat PlayStation, but leverage your, your, your strengths to create something that is disruptive to PlayStation, but not to your business, a console for PC game developers. Now, what the research shows is that there are five attributes of organizational structure that correlate with entrepreneurship. The first is that your structure has what academics call slack resources. Most of our clients don't like the word slack, so we say innovation resources. You resources both time and money that people can invest in new ideas. They have reward structures that encourage entrepreneurial behavior. Those could be formal reward structures like money. They can also be informal like um, advocacy and, um, and, uh, and recognition. They have structures that allow risk-taking. A good way to see if your organization has a structure that allows risk-taking is look for someone who tried something and failed, and do they still have a job? Do they, did they get a promotion because of their failure? 
or did their uh, what, what was their career put at risk? Um, uh, this is obvious, but often overlooked is strong leadership support when leaders start meetings talking about the need to innovate, when they give time on the agenda for innovative initiatives that may not represent yet a significant portion of revenue, then that allows others to innovate and encourages innovation. And then the fifth one is organizational freedom. Does your organization allow people to move between silos, between functions? How easy is it to create a cross-functional team? That has proven to be a really critical indicator of your ability to uh, allow for and unlock entrepreneurship. So those are the five key things under organizational structure. So step one, you've abandoned the myth. Step two, you've identified your entrepreneurs. Step three, you've assessed and addressed the structural barriers. Step four is culture. Now, culture is a profound Influ you know, influencer on behavior. And it determines the ideas that people see, which ones they choose to pursue, pursue how they act within them, um, act on those ideas. And if your um, um, values um, are things like teamwork, do the right thing, the customer's always right. You know, that's great. But those are the same values that your competitors um, uh, aspire to. Um, and I'm going to show you a slide now. This is the first time we've shown this slide, in part because we didn't have permission until today to show this slide. Uh, Campbell Soup has looked at reorganizing, redefining its values. Its values used to be things like teamwork and the customer's always right. And what they realized is in order to compete in the future, they need to enable and activate entrepreneurship. Uh, so there's one client of ours, Iris, Iris Nafji, who um, was, a, was a client of ours at Microsoft. Um, she was the head of, uh, um, um, of leadership development there, went to Campbell Soup to take on the same role. And she looked at those values, and she worked with the company to redefine their values. And they, de they decided on four values that they um, uh, recently out rolled out to the top 100 and today are announcing to the entire corporation. So the first is about doing the right thing. And that's about pursuing social uh, initiatives, pursuing food that is good for um, humans and good for society. Seeking the power um, to uh, disrupt. So uh, encouraging the seeking of disruptive ideas. Again, dis ideas ideally that are disruptive in the market and not to the company. Dare to be different. Uh, I learned this phrase recently, which is different is better than better. And so this reinforces strategic thinking and looking to do things that differentiate us from our competition. And the last one, which speaks directly to entrepreneurship, is own it like a founder. One thing that you see in the mindset of entrepreneurs is they view the company as their company. They don't listen necessarily to their manager, to their CEO. They have an idea of who their company is. Campbell Soup is a 140-year-old company, and the entrepreneurs there, they have a loyalty to that heritage, that history, and they have strong opinions about what is right for the company. One thing that we like to do is when you listen to uh, people when they talk about their company, do they say they or do they say we? Um, entrepreneurs uh, often say we. They view, they, they're committed to uh, the company and they act like owners. So what are the cultural attributes that are shown to correlate with innovativeness and internal entrepreneurship? There are a lot of hypotheses. Well, we went through the research and we looked for where is there a fact-based correlation. And these are the five things. If your culture encourages proactivity, then you potentially can drive entrepreneurship. If your culture encourages competitive and market intensity, an awareness of what the customer wants, an awareness of what the, mark, the, um, the, the competition is doing, if it encourages innovative behavior and thinking, if it allows for risk-taking and doesn't view risk-taking as failure but rather as learning, and if it allows for autonomous action, which is somewhat related to proactivity but different. 
So you want to look at, doesn't mean that you want to adopt these five as your cultural values, but you want to see to what extent your cultural values align with these five. Are you reinforcing these types of behaviors and values? So you've abandoned the myth. You found your entrepreneurs. You've addressed the structural barriers, and you've and you've looked at culture. Hopefully, shifted the culture. The last step is now you can take your people under the culture, supported by the culture, under the structure, supported by the culture, and start generating ideas, filling your idea pipeline. And one thing that we hear often from CEOs is, you know, we, you know, they'll whisper to us, uh, we we want our people to come up with ideas, but but really they. The ideas they come up with aren't very good, right? Uh, and one reason is that your people don't understand what your strategy is. Less than 40% of executives and senior managers, when asked what are, the two, what are two of their company's strategic priorities, less than 40% can name even two of those. So of course they're going to come up with bad ideas if they don't know what your mission is, what your purpose is, what's inbounds, what's out of bounds, what your capabilities are, what your assets are, right? Of course, they're not going to come up with great ideas. We looked at teams that came up with disruptive ideas. And what we found is that their conversations, 74%, McKinsey study says that 74% of strategic decisions are made outside of the formal planning process. And those conversations look mostly like this. They spend most of the time narrowing down options, taking options, perform, applying data to it, ruling them out to calculate the optimal option. Or they look for rules. They look at competitors. They look at best practices, and they look to close the rules. They look, look to close the gaps between you and best practices. And these do not drive innovative ideas. Instead, and if you've attended one of our OutThinker workshops, I'll go through this very quickly, um, you know this is our core program, the OutThinker workshop. And it breaks down a strategic conversation into five components. First, these teams define an impossible goal. They have an imagined conversation. They talk about the future. And importantly here, your entrepreneurs, they understand what are the trends that your company thinks are going to shape the future. They understand what your mission is. They understand what your strategic vision and intent is. And they get all that. And from that, they ask a question. And that question defines an impossible goal. They then dissect and they break down the business. They look at things like processes and people policies and channels and pricing strategies. And they don't look just at their area, but they understand the full system of your business. And they're able to identify where you're doing well, where you're not doing well, what your unique capabilities are that you could leverage, that they could leverage to create new revenue and new profit. Then they're innovative, so they generate lots and lots of potential strategies. Um, as you may know, we have a certain way of doing that with 36 narratives, and, that, and, they'll, and they'll generate 30, 40, 50, 100 possible strategies, while others will go come up with one idea and then pursue it. There's one thing I want to point out here. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. But if you think about it, an entrepreneur can come up with one idea. And on average, an entrepreneur pitches that idea to 40 investors before they find an investor that's a good match for the idea. The problem for an entrepreneur is fundamentally different. The problem for the entrepreneur is that you have one investor. You need to come up with 40 ideas to get the same success rate as an entrepreneur. So this is why it's important to be continually generating lots of ideas. And they have a close connection to the customer and the market, and they use that to generate lots of potential opportunities. Then when they analyze the idea, they work it into a business model that's disruptive to the market, but not to the business. And that is how they can choose disruptive strategies. And they can pursue disruptive strategies. And then, we talked about this already, they are excellent politicians. When they look to sell the idea internally, they know that is half the battle. And they don't even view it as a battle. They view it as a game. They view the political challenge as part of the problem-solving process. So imagine, dissect, expand, analyze, sell, sell spells ideas. And in our core OutThinker workshop, we train people in this structure so that they continually apply it to generate 
high potential growth ideas. And you need to generate lots of ideas. As Thomas Edison said, to get a good idea, you must first get a lot of ideas. And it is a lot of work. Um, we have over the years worked uh, with many groups within Microsoft. And we went back and looked at all of the ideation sessions and training sessions we've conducted since we first started working with them in 2004. And we think that we have touched at least 2,000 people there. We think that we have probably generated at least 20,000 growth ideas. And I can't even tell you if any of those ideas have actually made it into Microsoft's current strategy. We like to think that we had some role to play there. But the things that Microsoft is doing now, they own Skype, they're about to own LinkedIn, they have the largest developer community, the largest um, um, uh, community of online gamers. They're putting pieces in place that are completely transforming the company. And that comes from generating lots and lots and lots of ideas. So as they compete with each other, what comes out of that pipeline are some truly potentially exciting, disruptive ones. And one trick that we found really helpful for helping companies deal with the fact that these innovative ideas, even if you wrap them in a business model that's not disruptive to your core business, they typically seem impossible. See, disruptive ideas are inconsistent with some prevailing logic or belief that your competitors hold. And so your team exists in the same belief structure as your co competition, Therefore, they often also see the idea as impossible. So what uh, innovators are able to do is take those seemingly impossible ideas, recognize that just because they came up with the perfect mousetrap, that it doesn't mean that their boss and their organization is going to immediately fund that mousetrap. And they sit with these ideas. They keep them close to their vest, share them strategically, develop them, and they do what Albert Einstein says, which is, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just I stay with problems longer. When they recognize a good idea, they know it will take time to develop the idea. Because these ideas often have a low success rate. Um, Jeff Bezos said, given a 10% chance of 100 times payoff, you should take that bet every time. But you're still going to be wrong 9 times out of 10. Now, uh, revolutionary companies like Amazon, they can operate at this level of uncertainty. But your company, most of our companies cannot. There are two ways to address this. One is on the structural side to create a pool of investment or create uh, uh, incentive and uh, decision structures that allow this type of risk taking. But there is an even easier way, which is to reduce the risk of investment by reducing the amount you invest. Michael Schrage wrote a book recently called, well, not recent, maybe four or five years ago, called The Innovator's um, Hypothesis. And we've been using his framework with many companies, and they love it. It's a fi the idea is to take an idea, and rather than ask for it to be funded, rather than write a big business plan, run an experiment. Run a 555 experiment. Five people, five weeks, $5,000. You can get approval. Your people can get approval for this. If you can train people to run these kinds of low-cost, high-learning experiments, then you can overcome the, the risk barrier and get that, those ideas generated and through the pipeline. So there you go. Abandon the myth. Identify entrepreneurs. Address the structural barriers. Shift the culture and put in place a rigorous process to produce a pipeline of ideas. And you can increase your entrepreneurship. And this is kind of our, 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 um, our concluding uh, all-in-one-page slide. And this is what the research supports. There are other hypotheses, but we haven't put anything here that research does not statistically support as correlating with entrepreneurship. You need people who are innovative, autonomous, have competitive and market intensity, take calculated risks, are intrinsically motivated to innovate, and have political acumen. You need structures that have slack resources, have rewards that encourage entrepreneurial behavior, that allow for risk taking, that you need strong leadership and public leadership support, and you need organizational freedom. People can jump across between silos. 
You need a culture that is proactive, that encourages market competitive intensity, encourages innovativeness, encourages risk taking, encourages autonomy. And if you do that, then you can start producing the action, the ideas that will move you towards higher levels of entrepreneurial intensity. If you do that, the research says you'll grow faster, generate greater economic value added, greater shareholder return. And why is this important, not just for your business, but for the world? Well, you know, my dad, he didn't become a, 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 a machine operator. He moved to the United States. He followed his passion and he became a professor and he just completed, completed his 50th year teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. If you have heard of or use content analysis, it is because my father created that concept. If you use user-centered design, it is to a great extent because of the advances of my father and, 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 and even um, design thinking he contributed to. So we're all better because my father did not become a mechanic. And my mother, instead of marrying the, um, the, the man that she was uh, chosen to marry, to, to marry, instead she came to the United States and she also studied her passion. And, and how do we benefit? Well, there was a, a humanitarian disaster, a war in her, in, her, um, in her country. Three million people died in a six-month period, and she rallied support here in the United States to get the U.S. government to uh, prevent and, 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 and fight the, 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 the genocide going on. And her efforts probably contributed to saving millions of lives. She then went on to a career at the United Nations where she worked on getting fresh water to, town, to, to, to villages in Africa, to um, introducing family planning, to introducing more sustainable um, farming methods, and the world is a better place because she didn't fit into, she didn't follow the track that the system gave her. Now, 90% of our employees are disengaged at work, 9 out of 10, and Think about how the world could be a better place if we can unlock and enable their entrepreneurship. And that's what we're passionate about. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, we have um, some time for uh, questions. Uh, again, there are two ways that you can offer questions or ideas. You know, we're, we're continuing to advance our understanding of entrepreneurship. And I know I can see here that there are several entrepreneurs even on the call and so we'd love to also hear your ideas and your comments. So again, you can either raise your hand or you can type a question into the box that says questions. And I see a couple questions already um, coming up. So um, please uh, enter your question or raise your hand. So um, Christopher Shipper, uh, as an entrepreneur, if you constantly meet resistance, at many management levels. What is the advice? What advice can you give to those, analy those amazing employees? That's a great, great question. I'd love to hear um, what anyone on the call has to say. I can tell you a couple answers that I've heard in our interviews. Uh, Maritza, it's great to see you here as well. So maybe you have an idea. Um, the, um, so so I, I've heard entrepreneurs say, go find another company. Um, which is you know, probably not something that you want to tell your employees, but go find another company. Um, the other thing is, I think if you can reframe for them the idea that this is a problem, that this is an indication that our organization cannot innovate, but rather frame it as this is a natural part of the innovation process, that innovators view the, uh, the political challenge as part of the problem-solving process, then they'll see not that something's wrong, but they're on the path. There are also some techniques that you can um, provide them um, to um, enable them to be more skilled at managing um, uh, internal stakeholders. Um, there are, uh, in, a, in a future um, pod, um, um, a webinar, we'll, we'll go through one framework that, um, that, that we found particularly uh, helpful. Um, but, you know, you can uh, train them in stakeholder analysis and, um, and, and managing the political process. And the third thing that we think that there's a lot of potential for is creating learning circles 
cohorts of entrepreneurs, six people, maybe seven people, no more than that, who identify themselves as entrepreneurs, that have the attributes for entrepreneurs, put in a structure where they can support each other and get together every month or every six weeks and coach each other on their uh, efforts to drive entrepreneurship. And you know what often you'll find is that, um, that, 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 that everyone faces the similar uh, barriers to, of resistance and that there are techniques for uh, overcoming those. So I gave a very long answer there, uh, in part because that's the only question that is here, but I see everyone's still on. In fact, someone even just joined um, recently. So I'm guessing that this is a topic that is interesting to you, something that I'm very passionate about, but I do would love to hear your questions. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand or um, type a question into the question box. Okay. Well, I'll leave it there. Um, this is my contact information. Um, you can uh, email me directly at kaihan at outthinker.com. You can go to our website, outthinker.com, and uh, we produce a blog every week or twice a week that touches on uh, the topic of entrepreneurship and driving internal innovation. Um, we are starting to work with several companies and bringing this uh, program into their businesses. And if that's something of interest to you, we'd love to talk to you about it. If you have ideas on entrepreneurship, advice, uh, we would love to capture those and maybe write a podcast, blogcast, produce a podcast, and share your ideas and insights with uh, this growing community of entrepreneurs. Thank you very much for joining the webinar, and thank you very much for being part of the OutThinker community.